Hi everyone, today I'm going to be answering 10 of your questions and I'm going to try and answer a few that I haven't done before, including a few serious ones. We're going to start with a fairly weighty one from Steve B. James, I saw on a recent video you made comments about the punk rock baton being carried by comedians Dave Chappelle and Ricky Gervais. Both of these comedians, in my opinion, are huge sellouts choosing to use comedy to punch down at marginalised groups rather than attacking those who are in a position of authority and abuse their power. Chappelle, Gervais and their ilk seemingly only care about the massive amount of money they can make with this kind of lazy hack comedy. Isn't this the opposite of punk? Would you reconsider your position? Honestly, I'm always willing to reconsider my position on pretty much anything. You've got to hold everything with an open hand and be willing to change if new information comes to light. But that being said, I really do have some fundamental moral issues with the current rules of comedy, in particular the one that says you can only punch up, you can never punch down. And the massive problem I have with that whole philosophy is that it's saying that people aren't equals. As far as I'm concerned, we're all the same, we're all one, so where has this ladder of superiority come from? Honestly, I don't really get it. If we're all equal, punching up and punching down aren't things. There's no one above me and there's no one below me. If we value everyone equally, if we rank everyone equally, then punching up and punching down isn't a thing, there is only punching sideways. We are all on the same level. I think making some people fair game and others not is implying that some people are below you. And if everyone's value is equal, then everyone should be fair game for jokes. And certainly in the culture I come from at least, you can tell lads, for example, are good mates because they can crack jokes at each other's expense. I can only speak about my own culture, but in the world I come from, it is literally a sign of being equals. I don't like the idea of punching up and punching down because it subtly reinforces the idea that minorities are inferior, and they're not. Now, I do realise my position might seem a bit simplistic to some people, but I really am just basically a straightforward guy, and that's just the way I see it. I don't believe in this ladder of ranking people in order of inferiority. And honestly, that's why I haven't got a lot of time for this whole punching up, punching down thing. As far as I'm concerned, we're equal. Next up from George Price. Serious question. Any US tour plans? I would bloody love to do it, but it is very early days right now. So far, I've built up this channel so that it can fund proper professional level recording, mixing, mastering and manufacture as a record company might have done in the past. So that's step one complete. But the next mission is now to get a decent touring circuit going here in the UK. And so over the next year or two, getting out there live a bit more is the priority. So all I can say is hopefully one day if the master plan continues to work out. Number three is from Buddy Rich Forever. Hi James, do you ever think that something you may have said about an artist on one of your videos might upset them? or maybe thwart any chance you might actually meet one of your idols? Do you ever think twice in case of future consequences? Yeah, absolutely. Certain people are quite sensitive about what gets said about them, and I have definitely pissed off one or two famous people already. I probably should care more, but in a weird way, it's not actually about them anyway. My aim is not to particularly meet people. It's great when it happens, but my aim is to make good content. I try to tell the truth rather than kiss anybody's ass when I'm doing a documentary, and that includes my heroes. While I am a very enthusiastic person about the music I love, the people who made it are just people, aren't they, at the end of the day? Just as human and flawed as you or me. Even for big stars like Noel and Liam Gallagher, I try to say the good and the bad. And, let's be honest, people wouldn't really listen if they thought I was only ever presenting one side of the story. I'll just say what I think, try and be fair, and if people get pissed off, so be it. But with all that being said, the vast majority of my musical heroes that I've met have been absolutely brilliant. And everyone who's ever come on the channel has been a joy to work with, so it's only one or two really. Question number four. 
Hi James, I've been listening to your album lately. I think it's very good and has a great sound. Would you work with new bands either as a producer or mixing engineer and thus give more visibility to bands that are emerging? Unfortunately, I've had to kind of lay down my engineering, mixing, producing stuff because this channel has become so big and all-consuming. However, I do want to give exposure to up-and-coming emerging bands. In fact, it's part of the mission of this channel to do so. Here's the signs I'm looking for. The band should sound great and have good songs, properly produced, properly recorded and properly mixed. The band should be showing initiative, playing gigs regularly in cities and working to build their own following, rather than just making music and hoping someone else will do all the hard work for them. And lastly, the band should be taking their online presence seriously and generating their own online fan base as well. So, when I hear a new band I like, and I see they're building their own following live, and building their presence online, then I know I'm listening to a band who have the work ethic to actually make it. And I want to jump on that kind of bandwagon. Question number five. If you got Noel Gallagher in the hot seat, what's the one burning question you'd throw at him that would really rattle his brain? Blimey, I don't know. Uh, I do kind of fun, far-out stuff on this channel, mainly because you guys like it. But if I kind of got to meet Noel sort of off-camera, in all honesty, mostly what I'd be interested in is probably talking shop. I love vintage gear, and it'd be cool to know a bit about some of the vintage pieces he owns, and some of the really obscure stuff like 60s Mellotrons and the like. Now, I realise that's probably a lot less kind of out there than many of you guys were expecting. But if I was just asking for me, I'd be particularly interested in guitars, gear and vintage stuff. But I would also have to say that a Be Here Now tour supersonic style documentary on Blu-ray would be the coolest thing ever, with remastered concerts, GMEX in particular. That tour was insane and legendary, and there must be many more stories to tell. That was the band at Maximum Keith Moon, so I would love to one day get to watch the full story and hear the music in feature-length documentary form, up on the big screen, if possible. Question number six. Do you find people annoying who ask you not to forget to like, comment, subscribe, and click the notification bell? Yes, I bloody hate it. You are never going to hear me saying, smash that subscribe button and drop a like. The adverts, a necessary evil, are annoying enough. I try not to piss off my viewers even more by asking for stuff in every video. If you make good stuff, people will like and subscribe anyway. I try to only ask for things very occasionally, and if it winds me up in other people's videos, the chances are it will wind you guys up in my videos. So I try not to do it. Question number seven. If you were to make a super band, who would be the members? Okay, I have absolutely agonised over this question. And I've ended up with an absolutely fucking ridiculously massive band because that's the only way I could answer it. So we have Liam Gallagher from the 90s on lead vocals, Eric Clapton from the Cream era on lead guitar, Jimi Hendrix on second lead guitar. Him and Eric can just take it in turns, one doing lead and one doing rhythm. John Gom on acoustic guitar. This band already sounds completely mental. Jack Bruce on bass. John Lord from Deep Purple in the 70s on keys, Steve Jordan on drums, the entire horn section from the Briefcase Full of Blues album, the London Symphony Orchestra, and Bez stoned off his tits and dancing like a monkey. All songs written by a songwriting supergroup of Lennon, McCartney, Noel Gallagher, Johnny Marr, Morrissey, Paul Weller and Pete Townsend. And I defy anyone to beat that. Question number eight. Any chance of a second album? First was great, would love to hear some new tunes. Thanks for that. Yes, we are working on our second album right now. But in all honesty, it's probably not going to come out for a year or two yet because we're not cutting any corners at all this time through. We want the whole thing recorded at Rockfield exclusively, mixed at Abbey Road exclusively, and this time we're going to record up to 20 songs and then pick the best 10. So that is going to take time. In the meantime, however, we're trying to get gigs in UK cities lined up. As I have for the past few years been so focused on building up my online presence, my online following, I have sort of neglected the live stuff. 
quite a lot. But now, at last, we are on it, and once the touring circuit is sorted, the next priority after that will be album number two. And for anyone who fancies catching us live, we are playing at O'Neill's in York on Friday, May the 17th, 2024. It's a free gig and should be a top night, and there will be more live dates coming very soon. Question number nine. Hey James, from America. Why do I feel like the only person in the USA who gets Oasis? I tell my friends I love Oasis and they say, like Wonderwall, like it's some corny white bread bland thing. Is it because Liam is seen as a prick here? Good question. The UK and the USA really kind of parted ways, culturally speaking, in the 90s. The UK moved back towards a more punk mindset and lad culture, while the US went in a slightly different direction. Here, Liam and Noel were basically the figureheads of a cultural movement, whereas in the States they weren't really. So unfortunately, American Oasis fans didn't really get to experience Oasis in the full context. Where we saw Liam particularly as a bit of a hero and a revolutionary, in a different cultural context, somehow it just didn't translate properly. Interestingly, however, I have noticed that Oasis seem to be getting picked up over the pond a lot more these days. I have become aware recently that places like Boston, for example, do have a lot in common with British cities when it comes to mindset and attitude. It has seemed to me that in the 2020s, there is at last becoming a bit less of a cultural divide between the UK and the USA, and it has been interesting to see Oasis finally getting a bit more recognition in the States. And last of all, number 10, Tallow Manga asked, James, what are your favourite 10 bands of all time? A few people asked me this one, actually, and as any music fan knows, these lists change and evolve over time, but here is my current top 10 bands of all time. Number one is Cream. Number two is Oasis. Number three, The Beatles. Number four, Queen. Number five, The Jimi Hendrix Experience. Number six, here's a random one for you, the Blues Brothers Band from 1978 to 1982, when they were basically the cream of the New York City jazz scene. Number seven, Led Zeppelin. Number eight, Foo Fighters. Number nine, Jeff Buckley. And number 10, Nirvana. Let me know your top 10 in the comments below. And to any Philistines who want to argue that Oasis are better than cream, go listen to the second solo in Crossroads. Thanks so much to everyone who submitted a question. I did read every single one. This was loads of fun and I'm definitely going to do it again. Thanks so much for watching and as always, I'll see you next time.